My name on the order paper. My Lords, the Prosperity Fund's primary purpose is to uh, contribute to the U UN Sustainable Development Goals by addressing barriers to growth, uh, most relevantly but not exclusively, uh, SDG 8, promoting sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Programmes undertake robust design and assurance processes demonstrating how they meet this purpose. Each has a clear reporting indicator linking to the goals, and external contractors carry out rigorous um, monitoring and evaluation. And the Prosperity Fund is contributing towards the UK's SDG voluntary national review. Well, I thank the noble lady for that response. But the simple fact is that both the Independent Commission for Aid Impact and the International Development Committee in the other place, and others, many, many NGOs, have raised the fact that the Prosperity Fund is failing to adequately focus on supporting economic development that contributes to poverty reduction. Can the noble lady tell the House exactly how the government is addressing the concerns of both ICAI and the IDC? As I've already said, the uh, Prosperity's main focus is to support economic development. And in doing that, we hope and we are quite determined that this will have a big impact on the reduction of um, poverty. Extreme poverty has been reduced by 50% due to the increased focus on trade and economic growth. And whilst with aid we, we must help people, people in terrible conditions, we must support them, I have, to, I have to say that by investing in activities which drive economic growth, we believe that this will be the best way to uh, reduce poverty and increase economic growth. The Sustainable Development Goals 2 and 3 uh, claim to end, to reduce to zero hunger as well as good health and well-being. Now, every report lately has pointed to the increased food insecurity among so many people. We have currently four million kids who are not sure if they're going to get fed a decent meal today. What is the government doing to address those incredibly important goals, two and three of the SDGs? Noble Baroness raises a very important point. Nobody wants to see uh, children starve. And our aid uh, budget and our agencies that we work with, the NGOs, are doing everything they can to get food to these children uh, to ensure that they do not struggle in the way that we uh, hope they will not. Well, her Lords, the clearest answers that we've had uh, yet from ministers on the link between these funds and the Sustainable Development Goals, and I welcome that answer. But will the government take the opportunity during the UK's voluntary national review to the United Nations this summer to publish that detail in terms of monitoring and evaluation of these expenditures in relation to the goals? And will it do so not just for the Prosperity Fund, but for the other funds that are being spent by departments outside of the FID? The Noble Lord raises a very important point. Transparency is critical, and I do not believe there is any desire not to be transparent on these matters. Um, I can tell the Noble Lord that the CSSF is working hard to increase transparency and has made major progress. Over the past 18 months, the CSSF has listened to feedback and worked on publishing more information on its programmes, its objectives, and how these programmes are performing. And I've no doubt that if the Noble Lord doesn't think we're still getting up to scratch, he'll let us know. My Lord. How far does the government see prosperity and sustainability as going together or as, as different and sometimes contradictory goals? Am I conscious that as climate change uh, sweeps across the developing world, water shortages, for example, I saw an estimate recently that several million people in Iran are going to have to move because of, of, of water shortages as the, the water table goes down. How much attention is being paid to the the really difficult sustainability issues which so many developing countries are now facing from climate change. Um, the UK's aid investment is creating a safer, healthier and more prosperous world 
but on the point of sustainability, I feel I may be best in uh, gleaning some more information and writing to the Noble Lord to make sure I've got it correct. My Lords, my Lords um, the, fund, the website for the fund also states that it's to tackle programmes to tackle <coughs> barriers to prosperity for certain excluded groups, particularly rural women, young people and people with disabilities. So can my noble friend the Minister please outline how the fund is being used to tackle the barriers to prosperity that exist for many minority religious or belief groups who face high or very high levels of discrimination in over two-thirds of the countries in which DFID is seeking to work? Um, I think the, the, the answer to that question is, a, is around um, a, a, almost um, a cross-departmental um, range of activities. And my noble um, friend Lord Ahmed is working on freedom of religion, uh, and there is a great deal going on to ensure that women and children are helped uh, to achieve their potential so that they can play their full role <coughs> in the countries in which they live. <coughs> Sustainable development goals are there to eliminate world poverty. For the poorest people in the world, they have to be brought to a point at which they can play their part in the world economy. This is why aid is so important in building up the self-sustaining ability to play a part if British industry and investment can play a role in this, good. But would the noble, minister, the noble lady, the minister, not agree that the top priority within the point seven context is that we are always keeping our eye on the poorest and how they can be brought to the point at which they are able to play a part in the world economy? I'm very happy to confirm to the noble lord that it is the poorest that we want to help and we want to help them in their development and their uh, recovery from that and 97 percent of this fund goes to aid but i would also say that there is a small portion of it which gets invested in projects which actually help people in creating jobs creating better homes for them and creating for them a better life and all I do know is that some of these poorest people have a, a deep, deep history of pain and, you know, being very uncomfortable. And this fund is going to give them a destiny rather than a history. My Lords, I think we should be very proud of... Oh, seven minutes, seven and a half, divide, divide 30 by four and see what it... I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. M my Lords, there will be no additional controls on food and feed originating from the EU. However, non-EU high-risk food and feed consignments transiting the EU to the UK will be subject to controls and will enter the UK at ports with the required facilities to undertake those controls. Following analysis to determine the possible number of such transits, there are sufficient inspectors at UK ports with those facilities to undertake all relevant import controls. Uh, I, I thank uh, the Noble Minister for that reply, but he will know that the Department of Transport have agreed a number of new freight routes uh, from the EU to smaller UK ports as part of the contingency planning. But meanwhile, the, staff, the government seemed to be relying on existing staff in existing ports to carry out the food inspect inspections, despite the fact that they won't have access to the EU quality assurance documentation that they have had in the past. So is the Minister not concerned that as this becomes known, some unscrupulous EU and third country, third country uh, food importers will exploit these new routes that will now exist and offload their second rate or even contaminated food uh, when they know that they are unlikely to be checked? So what guarantees can he give that UK consumers, uh, to UK consumers that food imports will continue to be safe to eat in the event of no deal? My Lords, clearly, um, food safety, and we've been working very closely with the Food uh, uh, Safety Standards uh, Agency 
on all these matters. And as I say, there has been very con careful consideration with APHA, with the Food Standards Agency, HMRC, precisely to ascertain whether the Ports and Ports Health Authorities have got the appropriate facilities to accommodate what would be, we think, 6,000 additional checks required because of those transit goods. But the... <laughs> i better stop now. <laughs> <laughs> my Lords, I apologise. Uh, will my noble friend uh, satisfy those of us in this place and indeed those working as food inspectors that the regulations that are required to be, to be put in place will be passed before the 29th of March? Uh, what is the timetable for bringing forward those regulations uh, in this regard? My Lords, obviously the uh, readiness we need in particular in this case, which is with the transit goods, which I take is the whole subject matter, and these 6,000 additional checks, they will have to um, pre-notify the imports and work is very much well advanced and is working with importers and agents because absolutely what this is clear about is those that items that would not be inspected within the EU must be inspected and checked at the UK uh, points of entry. And that is why precisely that is in place and what we've been working on and the Border Delivery Group have been so insistent upon. My Lords, my, my lords I understand that uh, Ministers have taken a decision to instruct those operating at the border to prioritise flow and throughput over all other considerations for all goods. Could the Noble Lord, the Minister, tell us what the uh, risk assessment that has been in terms of public safety and what uh, assessment they have made of what the consequences of that decision and those recommendations to those operating at the border will be? My Lords, I don't identify with that. Biosecurity is absolutely paramount and the issue of human health. That is why precisely, for instance, the Food Standards Agency were very clear about there being no need on day one for additional controls to goods coming in from the EU, precisely because the same EU standards are required and will continue. The point about what we are doing and the additional checks that will be undertaken is precisely to ensure that our food is safe, and that is what I have said. The Port Health Authorities have said that they have adequate facilities to enable that to happen. My Lords, the Minister is, the minister is renowned for his uh, reputation as a moderate and sensible Minister in this Government. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so apart, apart, from maybe apart from maybe considering proposing President Tusk for the Charmaine Prize in view of his uh, sensible remarks, which were, have been uh, described as bullying, and they're not at all. They're very wise advice, but a bit late. Would he uh, consider now the, the total insanity of these policies, the leave policy, the list of leave measures that the government has intended to be? And there is an alternative still available to the government to pause, think again, and decide to stay in the European Union. Yeah. Um, my Lords, this, the subject, and my, I think my responsibility to the House is to answer the question, and the question is to assure your Lordships that all work is being undertaken to ensure whatever source around the world we welcome good food and good quality food to come is safe for human consumption. That is the responsibility I'm seeking to address this morning. Yes. Lords, the, the Minister this has spoken. This side. This side. This side. This side. This side. My Lords, the, the Minister has spoken of additional checks at borders uh, and new systems, but using current inspectors. So could the Minister tell the House what training those inspectors have had for the new systems and checks? Um, my Lords, it, and it's a very helpful question from the Labour Baroness, because currently there are about 91,000 consignments arriving from, a, from third countries. And this additional 6,000 I've mentioned to of consignments is precisely why, in the context of 91,000 and the 6,000, the port health authorities are confident that they have adequate facilities, adequate personnel. But of course, of course, if at any time in the future there was a need to look at this, of course that would be the responsible thing to do. We are working very closely with the Food Standards Agency and the Animal and Plant Health Agency with world-renowned experts there. 
Minister. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. The noble Lord, the Minister, not agree that the United Kingdom has the competence and capacity to produce 80 per cent of our foodstuffs, even for our widely diverse population, where such superb farmers here. Would it not be right for the government to stress firmly that the National Farmers Union and Britain's farmers deserve all the support and we don't need all these controls for imports? Others want to buy our food rather than the other way round. Um, my Lords, I should first declare my farming interests in the register. <laughs> of course we should champion domestic production. We have some of the best agricultural land in the world to produce the food that we do. But there are certain items we all enjoy and are good for our health that come from abroad. What we need to do is to ensure that all the food that comes from abroad uh, is safe for people to consume. And that's why we have the Food Standards Agency. That's why we have the APHA. But we produce very, very good food in this country too. Baroness Wormsley. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, if we enter an implementation period, the UK would remain part of the EU-wide system, with arrangements beyond that subject to negotiation. In the event the UK leaves without a deal, we will review options for an alternative to the new EU falsified medicines system. In the meantime, patient safety remains our priority. As the lead enforcement authority, the MHRA will be taking a pragmatic approach to ensure supply during the initial phase of operation. I thank the noble Baroness the Minister for her reply and welcome her to oral questions. Um, Under the falsified medicines directive, UK patients can have the confidence that their medicine is a genuine product and hasn't been tampered with. But if we have a hard Brexit, we'll only have seven weeks either to recreate the barcode system at great cost, which is impossible in the time, or agree a fee to remain part of the system. Has the UK had any preliminary negotiations about such an agreement? And if so, is there an estimate of what it would cost to be part of the system as a third country? And is this not yet another cost of Brexit, which the people were not told about in 2016? Well, I thank the noble lady for her question. Um, uh, As stated in the response to the MHRA's recent no-deal consultation, its expected stakeholders would no longer be able to comply with the requirement to verify and authenticate medicines, so legal obligations related to this would be removed. And in this scenario, we have committed to evaluate options for a future falsified medicines regulatory framework, taking into account investment made by stakeholders. But it is important to note that the majority of the FMD was already implemented in 2013, and also that the MHRA has 30 years of experience as a world-leading regulator of over 3,500 medicines. We expect that patients will remain safe and that there will be continuity of supply so we can have confidence in medicines and safety for patients. I congratulate the noble Baroness on her appointment. Um, but as she knows that the European medicines verification system comes effective I believe it's this Saturday. Is she confident that we have sufficient personnel and procedures for us to immediately implement that? And was she also saying that under the Prime Minister's preferred agreement, this protection would be included if the Commons approved it? So we are committed, and thank the Noble Lord for his question, we are committed to meeting the 9th of February deadline for the launch of FMD safety measures. We expect all stakeholders in the UK supply chain to be aiming to comply with the requirements. We know that much of the supply chain is already prepared, but it is a complex supply chain um, setting up medicine supply across the EU, and the main challenges are with regard to error messages. Several member states, including Denmark, Portugal, the Netherlands, and Ireland, unrelated to Brexit, have noted that there will be challenges in implementation. So the MHRA have notified the supply chain that we will be taking a pragmatic approach to implementation, and this is appropriate to ensure patient safety and a continuation of dispensing. My Lord, sir, to get her appointment, might I ask her to stress very strongly that... Um, is he going to I thank you. Would the noble Baroness the Minister agree that with the implementation 
of the falsification of medicines regulation, which also goes with the European Medicines Registry for verification of medicine. It will be rather unusual if UK, even in a no-Brexit situation, no-deal Brexit situation, <coughs> did not have access to the European Medicines Registry, because that would mean decommissioning of medicine will not be possible to go on the registry. Any medicine that is dispensed in this country, that medicine has to be decommissioned. So MHRA, I hope she agrees, will have to work with the European Medicine Agency to achieve this. Well, I thank the noble Lord Or Patel for his question, and obviously he has great expertise in this area. Um, obviously, the government has been clear that life sciences is a key sector for the United Kingdom and has stated in its political declaration that we want to have close alignment with the European Union and continue close collaboration between the EMA and the MHRA going forward. This will obviously be subject to negotiation depending on the outcome of the ex. Um, the MHRA, however, is a world-leading organisation. We can be proud um, of the expertise that they have in licensing, devices, ex inspections, batch release, and also pharmacovigilance. They are globally recognised and respected, and we want to ensure that their shared experiences continue for the benefit of both UK and EU patients. The noble lady, the minister, might I ask her to stress that the privatisation of our medicines agency, which is the most successful one in the globe, which everyone else follows, now enables us to sell widely and contract with other uh, member states in the EU and elsewhere that our standards are global and that they can now buy into us, and it's a tremendous advance. The noble lady is absolutely right that the MHRA is globally recognised and that it has set the standards worldwide. We want to ensure that as we go into EU exit, those standards continue and our reputation is maintained internationally. My Lord. That the government and in, in, in these and other areas where legislative responsibility is shared between the UK government and the devolved governments, that there are appropriate arrangements in place, despite the political disagreements that may be in place, appropriate arrangements in place behind the scenes to fully engage the devolved governments in discussions on these preparations for any scenario over the next few weeks. The noble lord is absolutely right. There is um, strong representation of life sciences in all four nations of the United Kingdom, and engagement has been going on across the devolved administrations and will continue to be so. <coughs> lord Garrel Jones. My lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My lords, on the 4th of February, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, announced that the United Kingdom recognised Juan Guido as the constitutional interim president of Venezuela until credible presidential elections can be held. The United Kingdom, alongside its international partners, is committed to working to, a sec to secure a peaceful solution to this crisis and prevent the risk of further violence. Our focus is on supporting the democratically elected parliament of Venezuela to resolve the current crisis to the benefit of the Venezuelan people. My Lords, I commend the government in joining with Germany, France, Spain and others in Europe in rejecting the failed administration of Maduro. Can I ask my noble friend if going forward, uh, as soon as it's possible to do so, the United <coughs> Kingdom government will provide uh, aid for the humanitarian crisis that is at present facing that country. And furthermore, when we do get a democratically elected government, will Her Majesty's government make representations to the IMF and other international lenders for the huge debt that will be inherited from the failed administration to be uh, re, um, renegotiated? And lastly, has the, Her Majesty's government had any indication that the leader of the opposition in another place has had a change of heart, or does he continue, along with Russia and China, to support the failed Maduro administration? Yeah, yeah. My Lords, um, firstly, on the issue of humanitarian aid, I think we've all watched both pictures on the television about the desperate plight of the Venezuelan people, and I can assure my noble friend that DFID are working very closely with my right honourable friend, the Minister for the Americans, 
um, America's uh, Sir Alan Duncan, and we're already working through UN agencies in providing essential funding, particularly to the over 3.2 million people who have fleed from Venezuela since this crisis began. On his second point, again, a very pertinent question on the IMF. I assure uh, my noble friend that reconstruction in Venezuela will require support, as he recognises, from the international financial institution. And when the time is right, I can assure him the UK will work closely with those institutions and all like-minded international partners with the aim of getting Venezuela's economy back on track. In terms of his final question, on the position of Her Majesty's opposition, in particular the leader of Her Majesty's uh, opposition. I'm minded by a fact, whilst I've not heard directly from him, I did follow the speech of the shadow foreign secretary who answered a question on Venezuela yesterday. And if, uh, I'm sure the noble Lord Collins is taking notes. Um, I'm sure he followed. Uh, 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 I will, but I'm answering the question first. Um, I, I was minded by one fact, that she uh, said that we should be led by the countries of the region. Well, the countries of the region who have recognised the interim president, let's leave the US and Canada aside, are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Guatemala, Panama, Paraguay and Peru. Now, if she wants to follow the lead of the region, I suggest Her Majesty's opposition look at that list very carefully. I'm answering the question. I really must intervene. The noble lord has used this question as a statement. The statement is not being repeated in this chamber. And let me make it absolutely clear: the position of the opposition is that democracy has failed in Venezuela, and the sooner that we get free and fair elections, the better. But what we want to see from this government is the noble lord said a very clear commitment to work with the international community to ensure that the humanitarian and economic crisis in South America and in Venezuela is addressed, because we know Trump won't address it. Yeah. Well, I ask the noble lord again. We are addressing it, and I've given a clear indication of what this government's doing. The, the opposition need to step up to the mark. If you ask one question, one question, to the people of Venezuela, what is the freedom they're fighting for? They want free and fair elections. Maduro has not given it. It's time Her Majesty's op opposition recognised the interim president. My lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, my lords, my lords. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, my lords, given that Maduro hasn't given up and given that the army hasn't deserted him, what action can we take and take to warn Maduro to respect the right of the Venezuelans to demonstrate peacefully without risk to life and limb? And is there action that the Bank of England can take uh, to hold Venezuelan funds, which Maduro is apparently trying to access at the moment? The noble lady raises an important point about the Bank of England, and I'm sure the Bank of England, with its independent role, will reflect that it abides by all rules, and I'm sure it's looking at the situation in Venezuela very closely. She raises a very pertinent point about the peaceful resolution, and that is why we believe, along with other like-minded nations, including leading European nations, that recognising the interim president is an important first step, and we now call for Maduro to step aside and announce the appropriate date so presidential elections can take place. I the Minister that I have some related unanswered questions uh, which I, he will no doubt address in, in due course. Can the Minister confirm whether gold assets are being held by the Bank of England uh, on behalf of the Central Bank uh, of Venezuela? Uh, has there been any request to effect a transfer of any part uh, of these assets? Um, and is the Government empowered to block future requests for anything other than a proven legitimate reason. I think with any matters of the Bank of England, it's really appropriate for the Bank of England in terms of confidentiality to respond. But the final point the Noble Lord makes is an important one, that the Bank of England, in making <coughs> any request for any client, I'm sure would look at the appropriate and legitimacy of the person and the client making that request. My Lord. Others, the uh, decision of Her Majesty's <laughs> Government to uh, support other allies and democracies in, um, in support of uh, Juan uh, Guaido. But um, would he not accept also there is really a very urgent need to encourage all democratic parties, across party, this isn't a party issue, 
to condemn the uh, socialist despot, Mr. Madeira, yeah. and his pitiless administration. This is a cause that, as a democracy, surely all parties in this nation should roundly support. My noble friend makes a very important point, and as I've said already, we've asked Maduro to step aside along with other nations from within the region, as well as European partners. If you look at the current situation in terms of the economy, in terms of the suppression of freedom of speech, freedom of the press in Venezuela, the situation is dire, and it needs recognition by all parties across this House and beyond to ensure that we recognise the interim president. Yeah.